couple of the basic principles of interpretation. So just to give you a little bit of background of what we're going to be covering, um, uh, lessons one through four will be the introduction to hermeneutics. We'll explain that. Uh, lesson five will be bridging the gaps that there are. Lesson six will be foundations for biblical study. Lesson seven will be the context principle. I can turn my mic down just a little bit more. I'm getting a little feedback here. Uh, lesson number eight, the comparative, comparative mention principle. We'll be talking and explaining that. The complete mention principle. Uh, lesson 11 will be the covenantal principle about covenants. Uh, lesson 12 will be the ethnic division principle. Lesson 13 will be the uh, chromometrical principle. The breach principle will be lesson 14. The Christocentric principle in 15. The moral principle in lesson 16, identifying figures of speech. Sometimes the Bible talks in figures of speech and not literal, and we can't take those things literally. Uh, interpreting symbols, we'll be talking about that in lesson 18. 19 and 20 will be interpreting the different types. Uh, 21 will be interpreting the parables. 22 will be interpreting the narratives. 23 will be interpreting prophecy. And then 24, the application of hermeneutics. So um, we're going to be talking about these things. Um, who has ever heard someone say that we need to have a healthy love for ourselves? Remember we always hear that, you've got to have a healthy love for ourselves. Let's take a look at Luke 10.27 for a moment. And um, on the scripture you see it says, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and, the, and in thy neighbor as thyself. Let's just open in prayer for us. Father, we thank you, we praise you. God, I ask you to give me the uh, illumination, the revelation, the anointing, Father, to bring forth this teaching so that we can properly understand you and properly understand your word. Father, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, and we thank you tonight. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, amen. So where Jesus says that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, we get, a, we get an inclination from that scripture that we're supposed to love ourselves. But the Bible says that we're to crucify the self, right? We're not to love ourselves. The scripture here is talking about, in context, the passage has nothing to do with loving ourselves, but loving others in sacrificial in a sacrificial way. If you read the rest of the scriptures, it talks about the Good Samaritan, how he found somebody on the side of the road, and he sacrificed his money, his time, his efforts to love someone else. So the emphasis isn't on loving ourselves, the emphasis is on loving other people. Amen? Who has ever heard someone commenting on how a person's talents and gifts will open doors for them. Ever hear about that? Let's look at this next scripture here. In Proverbs 18, 16, it says, A man's gift maketh room for him, and bringeth him before great men. What does that scripture mean to you? What does that scripture mean to you? What does that scripture mean to you? Wait, let's get this so we can get this on a... Who's fast? I need somebody fast. Who's fast? Come on, somebody fast. Rebecca, you're fast. Come on. Yep, I want you to come up here and get the mic in. And whoever raises their hand, I want you to run back there. And I think... Um, Alicia, you raised your hand, right? What does this scripture mean to you? It, it means that God gave men gifts and that um, with that gift, God will use you in front of, use you with people. Okay, someone else. Let's give somebody else, somebody else a chance. What does that scripture mean to someone else? Don't be shy, come on. Very similar, 
God gives man gifts, and he creates opportunities for those gifts to be used. Okay. Some of the other versions make it a little more clearer. Now, I am a King James Bible person. I preach out of the King James. I teach out of the King James. But some of the words are Old English, and you need to get the new... You need to get the definition of those words because they've changed over certain periods of time. We'll get into that. Okay, this scripture, by reading it on its surface, says a man's gift makes room for him, right? And bringeth him here before great people. But actually, what this scripture is saying is a gift will get you in to see anyone. It's a bribe. You know, if I want to get in to see somebody, if I want to go into a restaurant, right, I, I pull out a 20 or 30 or $40, $40 and I hand it to the person. They go, oh, come in right away. So this scripture is actually talking about a bribe. It's not talking about a spiritual gift. Do you see the importance of interpretation? You see the importance of context? You see the importance because you can, and I've always said that too. I, I read that scripture so many times and thought the same thing you did. Until I looked at it and I says, oh, man, wow. It means something totally different. Who has ever indicated that it is good for people to enter into the experience of their teaching first before they expect others to do so? And then quote 2 Timothy 2.6. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruits. Many times you hear people say, well, you know, you gotta, before you can teach anything, you've got to make sure that you've got the lesson yourself. But that's not what it's saying. In the NIV, it says this, the hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. So it has absolutely nothing to do with someone teaching and getting experience from that teaching or having experience in that teaching. It's talking about being a partaker of fruits. It's talking about a farmer. It's talking about being a partaker, he should be able to get some of the first fruits himself. And those are just a couple of examples. And these illustrations all point out the need for a study in biblical interpretation. The Bible is also the most important book in the whole world. It's been on a number one selling list for years and years and years. Even atheists or agnostics will throw Words of the Bible back at Christians when they use phrases like, and you probably heard this, you probably heard some Christians say this, judge not, don't judge. The Bible says for you not to judge. And what it is is they don't realize that when they say things like that, they are totally misunderstanding the intent of the Scriptures that they have quoted. But a lot of Christians say the same thing. Oh, we're not to judge. And they're misinterpreting the Bible. Because the Bible does tell us to judge. You have to read in Corinthians. It talks about those that are without, we don't judge. The, the non-Christians, we don't judge them because they're doing only what's natural to them, what comes natural. But we're to judge those who are within the church. Amen? Let me ask you a question. Before I do that, let me, let me just make a statement. The Bible is open to being used in these ways because people do not utilize a proper, or don't utilize proper biblical interpretation. And that's what this course is going to be about. Studying proper uh, principles of interpretation so that when we stand up and preach or quote from the Bible, we can do so with a sense of authority. Remember, God's authority is only behind what His Word actually means, not what we say it means or what we think. We can do it in a way that we know that God will back us up. Amen? Amen? So my first question is this. Is the book an open or closed book? An open or closed book. 
Can you understand it or can't you understand it? Well, do you have to have a seminary degree to understand the Bible? Shout it out. Come on. Can the average Christian understand the Bible or is it a futile endeavor? Can the average Christian understand the Bible? Must we go to uh, the, uh, the, the uh, clerical elite to understand the truth of God's word? No. But what happens is a lot of times is Christians don't have study skills or they don't take the time to study the scriptures. Now, before I go on, I'm going to have them put up that other uh, slide for you. No, uh, no, the one the one before. The other, the other one that you put up first. No, not that one. The one that you put up first, the slide that you put up first. I said change it. No. I think you need new glasses. Okay. The syllabus we're going to be taking from is this book here. Now, you can purchase it if you want to, or I can buy it for you. If you want it, you let me know, okay, and I'll get it for you. That's going to be the syllabus we'll be using. Um, I strongly recommend that you do in order to refer back to the information we'll be covering and to help you build your library. Every Christian should have a, a library, whether it be small. It doesn't have to be a big library. But it should be a library that consists of some things I'm going to show you now. This book sells for about $15. You can get it from CBD. Um, I recommend it very highly. If you get it, it will help you tremendously. And uh, you can always look back on it. You, you, know, you can always go back and look at it and read it. The second slide I want to share is that you should always have these two books in your, in your library. If you're, if you're real concerned about the Bible, you really want to know about the words in the Bible because some words mean different. Like I'll give you an example. Like the Bible says, I think it's in Peter, says uh, about wives, you will win your husband by your chaste conversation. Now, the word conversation in today's English means dialogue. But back in biblical days, conversation meant lifestyle. But if you don't know that, you're going to think it means just talking back and forth. So, wives, you need to be quiet and not try to win your husbands by your conversation. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that. It means by your lifestyle, how you live. So these are two books that I recommend that you get. Uh, one is Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of the Old and New Testament Words. Uh, sells for about $12.99. You can get different prices. Different, sometimes they have a special at CBD. Um, Sometimes it's $8.99 or $9.99. The other is Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. It sells for about $19.99. But that, that book there has every single word of, in the Bible. It has every single word in it. So like, say you're thinking of a scripture. Um, uh, it says something about a hand. The hand is not short. Where is that scripture? I can't find that scripture about the hand. If you go into that Strong's and you open it up and you go to the word hand, it'll show you every scripture in the Bible where that word hand is. And you go through and you say, I think it's in the Old Testament. So you go through the Old Testament and you go, oh yeah, there it is. It's in Isaiah. Okay? The hand is not showing that you cannot reach. And you look up that word and, and, and to your right you'll have a column and it says a Hebrew. It'll be in Hebrew. And it'll say number 1860. I'm just throwing that number out because that's not the number, but that's what it would be. 1860 we'll say. And so what you would do is you go to the back, of the, the back of the Strong's and it has a Greek and a Hebrew dictionary. And you look up that number, it'll give you the Hebrew root word for that so that you can understand it even more. Now, for the real serious Bible studier, okay, I mean, if you're really serious and you want to get into the Bible, we have these two dictionaries. This one, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, sells for about $129, and that's the retail of CBD. That book, that can sell anywhere from three or $400. It's a very exhaustive. Uh, I have it in my library in, in, the, in my office. Uh, the other one is a, is a one-volume. That one's, uh, for some reason, maybe because it's, it's, it's a rare book, 
anywhere from twenty-six to eighty-nine dollars. Okay. But uh, I have the single volume, and if you ever want to borrow it, you can borrow it with this exception, uh, this um, condition. If you borrow it, you spill coffee on it, you ruin it, you got to buy me a new one. You lose it, you got to buy me a new one. It's got to be replaced. Okay. Uh, I lend out my books all the time, and sometimes I forget who I lend them to, and I never get them back. I've lost some great volumes that way. Okay, but um, uh, these two, these two are really, if you really, that one on the left, the blue, um, kind of purplish blue, whatever, uh, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, that has some really good, good studies in it because it gives you not only the biblical definition but how it was used in Greek culture at that time. And so it's a really good, really exhaustive study if you really want to get into it. Um, years ago, I would get into the uh, study, and I'd study one word for five, six, seven, eight hours, just one word, tracing it back through the history, where it came from, how it was used, the culture it was used in. Because a lot of times we lose the, the meaning of a word when they change the word. Okay. And you know they've done that even in, in, in our modern-day English. Okay, I can use it with the word gay. Okay, just a few years ago, gay meant happy. Now it means you're gay. <laughs> so it's, it, it, it's changed, okay? Uh, you know, uh, you know when, I was, when I was a teenager, you know, when we used to want to go somewhere, we, we used to say, okay, we're going to hook up. You can't say that today because it means a whole different thing than it mean, meant when I said that. It meant just mean, hey, let's get together, go do something. But today it means something in a sexual connotation. But these two books are excellent books to get to help you to understand and interpret the Bible. If you're really interested and you really want to know, see, God doesn't like lazy people. Okay? God doesn't want you just to pull a, a meaning of something out of your hat, out of your head, and say, oh, I think it means this. No, you can't do that. Okay. Then the next thing is this is a Hebrew work. I have these books. All, all the books that I'm showing you, I have. Okay. These, and I've used. These books here, Theological Workbook of the Old Testament, that is also uh, coded to Strong's Concordance. Remember the first one I showed you for 1999? This one is also coded to that because it has a Hebrew dictionary. And what you do is you look up the word in the Strong's in the Hebrew, and it might be, say, 2037. You go to the back of one of these, it gives you a whole index. You look up 2037, it'll say page 97. You go to page 97, it gives you the, gives you the Hebrew, a little bit more extensive study on that. Okay? So that's it for, that, for that, um, that, those um, books. If you want to know what they are later on, I can tell you what they are, and uh, I can also get them for you. The Bible is a book that is open for some and closed for others. Did you know that? Uh, before we go into that, I think I had another scripture, though. Did I have another scripture? Or did, it, did I put it up there? I'm not sure. What was that? Go back to that other slide that you had. No, the other set of slides that you had. Yeah. This scripture here, Psalm 59, verse 10, right? It says, the God of my mercy shall what? Prevent me. God shall let me see my desires upon my enemies. What does that mean? Somebody give me the meaning of that. Anybody got it? The God of my mercy shall prevent me. Somebody, somebody's looking up some stuff. God shall let me see my desire upon my enemies. No idea, right? Okay, look at the word prevent. Today, the word prevent means to stop. Okay? But the word in the Hebrew means accompany me. So the, 
true meaning of this is the God of my mercy shall accompany me. So if you interpret it with the wording of today, you'd have the wrong interpretation. Got it? All right. The Bible is a closed book to the lost. Now, if you can, uh, Jesse, go to one of the backgrounds that we normally use, and you put up the scripture. You put up the scripture, 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man, say the natural man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man, the man who is not a Christian, who operates and thinks in the natural, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. This is more than just a historical book. This is more than just a bunch of letters. This is God-breathed, inspired by God, written by man, but inspired by God. This is the very breath of God that has been breathed onto these pages so that you and I could have what is now called the Word of God. But the natural man cannot understand or cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Cannot receive it. That's why some people don't read the Bible. They say, oh, I don't understand that. Well, you're not, you can't if you're not born again. Because once you're born again, you have the Spirit of Christ living in you. He will give you and help you to understand the Word of God. In fact, the Bible even goes on to say, for they are foolishness unto him. To who? Huh? See, now you're getting how to interpret now. Okay? That's right. They are foolish in him. Neither can he know them. He can't know them. Just like the atheist that would come back to you and say, don't judge, you're judging me. Don't judge. The Bible says for you not to judge me. Well, in a sense, that's true. But they're going to be judged by the Holy Spirit. Why was the Holy Spirit sent? Not from, no, not from, I'm not talking from the church aspect. I'm talking from the world aspect. Because the Holy Spirit was sent for the church, but he was also sent on a mission for the world too. Anybody know what that is? Yes. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Pastor. To convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit is here not only for the church, but so that the church or the, or the people of God can go and preach the gospel, and the Holy Spirit can bring conviction, judgment, and righteousness. He says they cannot know them because there's the reason. Here's the reason. They are spiritually discerned. If you have brothers or sisters or uncles or aunties or cousins or people that you know that are not Christians, they're not born again, yet they stand there toe-to-toe -to -toe with thinking that they know what the Bible says. They don't know what it says. In fact, you have far more superior knowledge in the Scriptures if you have been a Christian for a while than a natural person. You don't need to go to seminary. You don't need to get a degree. You don't need to have all of those things. But the Holy Spirit will teach you, and He teaches you how. Some through men, some through books. I, I, some of these people that crack me up, they say, oh, I don't need anybody. I don't need anybody. The Holy Spirit will teach me. Well, excuse me. There's no such thing as self-taught. No such thing. Well, I'm self-taught. You're self-taught, yeah. Well, how come you have a $10,000 library? If you're self-taught, all you have is the Bible in you. But somebody... Put a Bible together, whether it's a commentary, a Jimmy Swaggart commentary, whatever. You're learning somehow. 
The ones that say it's only them and the Holy Spirit, I question their interpretation. Because the Bible says that he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So God will teach you through pastors and teachers. That's how the Holy Spirit operates. Now, he can teach you at home by yourself, absolutely. But that's not inclusive. That's not just you and the Holy Spirit, because sometimes you'll go off the wall. I know somebody personally that's gone off the wall because they've got a hold of the wrong commentaries or the wrong uh, study material and began to study things about the Holy Spirit now where they don't even believe the Holy Spirit's a person anymore. That blows my mind. How can you, how can you believe that? After all the scriptures, I asked them a simple question. Is God a person? Or is he just an inanimate object in the sky? An intelligence of mind, just, a, just an intelligence. Or is he a person? They said, no, no, God's a person. I said, well, is the Holy Spirit God? And they have to say yes. Well, then it's not an impersonal force. He's a person. They cannot because they are spiritually discerned. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. This is in the introduction to, her, to hermeneutics. It says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Say it with me. The God of this age has has blinded. Do you know why your wife doesn't see? Do you know why your husband doesn't see? Do you know why your kids don't see? Your nephews, your aunties, uncles, fathers, mothers, whoever they may be, you know why they don't see? Because their minds have been blinded. You know why teenagers don't see? Because their minds have been blinded by who? The God of this world, Satan, Lucifer. I got somebody shaking their head, no. Yeah, he's real. Lucifer is real. You're too young to understand that, but he's real. Either Jesus is the truth, and Jesus said he's real, or we believe you. I'd rather believe Jesus, because he was with the Father in heaven when he cast out Satan out of heaven to the earth. whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. People that say, I don't want to be a Christian, they don't believe. They have every right to not believe. That's their free choice. But because they don't believe doesn't mean that that's not the truth. Simply because a bunch of people believe. You say, well, the whole, the whole world, and there's more people that don't believe than people that do believe. That's right. Well, let me ask you a question. Was Noah right or was the world right? There was only eight people that were in the ark out of all of humanity. So majority doesn't rule. What rules is truth. Can I get a good amen? And, but he gives, he gives something here. He says, Who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel or the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So when you pray for your loved ones, when you pray for your, for your relatives, when you pray for your sons and your daughters and your husbands and your wives and your uncles and your aunties, pray that the light of the glorious gospel will shine upon their darkened heart. Begin to bind the spirit of, 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 of Satanism that has blinded the minds of your husband, of your kids, of your mother, of your father, whoever it may be, whoever it may apply to who's listening. So we have the Bible as a closed book to the unbeliever. So when you're with an unbeliever, don't be talking about Revelation, the angels coming, the white horses and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and don't talk about you know the Ezekiel's wheel spinning in the air and all this kind of stuff. Don't be talking about that. They don't understand that stuff. They're going to think you're crazy. Don't talk about Revelation and 
uh, all that stuff. They, they, don't, they don't know the truth. They, don't, they cannot discern those things because they are not saved. Neither can they know them. So the only thing that's going to get them is what? The gospel. Right? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear unless a preacher is sent? So the only way they're going to hear is if you give them a track or if you witness by your life, how you live, what you do, where you go. So the Bible is a closed book to some, but the Bible is open to the believer. 1 John 2.27 says this, God has given the Holy Spirit to the believer to help lead and guide them into all truth. Look at John 16, 13. I'm sorry, give me John 13. Uh, John 16, 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he's already come, he will guide you into what? All truth. Always remember this. The Holy Spirit will never lead you into error. Keep that as a tool in the back of your mind. The Holy Spirit will never lead you into error. If someone says the Holy Spirit's leading me into error, you know something's wrong. Well, you know, I, Pastor, I don't know, but I, I sense the Holy Ghost leading me to rob that bank. You know, I got a need, and, and the Lord said to meet that need by robbing the bank. Well, you can know one thing. He, he ain't listening to the spirit of truth. He's listening to a spirit of error. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit is also the anointing. 1 John 2.27 says this, But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. Now that does not mean, again, watch out for interpretation. You can't have Scripture contradicting Scripture. He says He gives teachers. Now it's saying here, Oh, the anointing is received by in you and that you need no man to teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. But again, what is the structure that Jesus had set up for the church? If we take one piece out, you, you're missing it. But when he says this, the Holy Spirit is going to come, the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But it doesn't mean that you don't have to have anyone teach you. You follow what I'm saying? There are times when God will teach you things, and nobody will know it. There's, you know what I'm saying? Nobody's been inputting, been putting input into you about that thing. That's happened many times. I remember um, a friend of mine, Ed Aruda, his son Stephen. He was only about seven years old. And some people would say, well, look, why don't you just get a newer version of the Bible? Because you've got to watch out for these newer versions because they have to change 100,000 words in order to keep the entire royalties. So when they do that, you weaken, as you start taking words and changing them and making them weaker, weaker, they're good for comparative study, but I always go with the King James because that's solid. Okay? But you can use the other translations. You can get them online for free. I think it's Bible Gateway. You go to Bible Gateway, you get all the translations free. Use that as a comparative, but don't use it as a major interpreter for Scripture, like the, mess, the Message Bible or the Living Bible. Those are paraphrased. They're not literal translations. So you may get off the road somewhere. 
But see, remember that Jesus, the Holy Spirit is not going to speak of himself, but that which he hears, he's going to speak. So whatever Jesus has spoken, he's going to bring it to your remembrance. Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, or the Father, gave the, the uh, scriptures by holy inspiration. We know that from Timothy. All scriptures given by God is, is inspired by God. So we understand that. So the writings of Paul are just as authoritative as the words of Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the words that Paul wrote are just as authoritative as Jesus' words? Why? Because it's the word of God. All scripture is given. Okay? It has the same authority. Let me ask you this question before I go on. Do you believe that this contains... How many believe, what showing of hands, how many believe this contains the Word of God? Now, how many of you believe this is the Word of God? It doesn't just contain it. It is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. It's not fairy tales. It's not just history. It's not just literature. This is the very Word of God. Of God and how you react to it and how you interpret it and how you live it is going to be determined on how you perceive it. If you only perceive that it contains the Word of God, you're not going to apply its principles. But if you believe that these are the inspired words of God and that it can create life in you, that it not only contains God's Word, but it is God's Word. All of this has everything to do with what we're talking about tonight. There are many, many disagreements on Scripture. You know, some are post-trib, mid-trib, pre-trib. Some believe in the rapture. Some don't believe in the rapture. Some believe in the second coming. Some don't believe in the second coming. Some believe we're going to go to slow, soul sleep. Some people say we're going to sleep all night. Some people believe in, believe in annihilation. So many different teachings out there and, and thoughts. But one thing's for sure, the basic meaning of Scripture or the basic message of the Scriptures is that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, is the Son of God, was crucified, died, was buried, rose from the dead, and is coming back again. That's accepted. John 20, verse 30 and 31 says, and, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, <clears throat> excuse me, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. 1 Peter 2, 2 says this, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. He's talking to every single believer. So in order for you to receive it as milk, you've got to understand it. Right? The Bible was given to enlighten everyone from children to adults. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14 and 15 says this, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. How did he know the Holy Scriptures? His grandmother taught him. Somebody taught him. He didn't just sit there by himself and say, Okay, I know... I know the Holy Scriptures. No, somebody taught him. Who you have learned, and from the childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Here's another fact. 
that the Bible was written in the common Greek of the day rather than that of the educated elite supports the fact that the Bible was written to the common man. This is why the reformers over the years, beginning with Martin Luther, were so motivated to get the Bible into the common language of people. They knew that if the people could just read the Bible without any other assistance, they would be changed forever. One of the biggest religions or denominations in the world, the Catholic Church, kept everyday ordinary people away from reading their Bibles. They didn't want you to read the Bible because when you start reading the Bible, you'll start seeing the truth on many instances and circumstances. Like you'll start reading the Bible and you'll see that their first pope, Peter, was married. Don't be shocked by that, but he was. Because the Bible says that Peter's mother-in-law lay sick of a fever and Jesus went to his house and healed her. You can only have a mother-in-law if you are... Uh, thank you. Or you start reading things like Jesus had bro half-brothers and sisters. So Mary wasn't a virgin all the time. She was a virgin, was impregnated by the Holy Ghost, had Jesus, and had other children, according to the Scriptures. Now, they, of course, they say, well, that was that, that other brother, and that brother means cousins. But I went up and I looked at it in the Greek. And when Jesus was in, the, was in Mary's womb and she went to go see Elizabeth, remember? And it says, and the baby leaped. Elizabeth was her cousin. So I looked up the word in the Greek cousin, and I looked up the word brethren. They're not the same word. So they're trying to fool somebody. Doesn't mean brethren. It means, uh, doesn't mean cousins. It means brethren. So when you start reading the Bible, you start seeing things. The same with Jehovah Witnesses. They come and they tell you, they, oh, they read the King James Bible. They have a King James Bible. But in their left hand, they have the watchtower. They say, you must interpret the scriptures through the watchtower. No, you don't need any man to teach you. No unsaved, cultic thinking that doesn't know scripture. You follow me now? The Bible was written in language that is clear. Very clear. Scripture gives you a mandate. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What does it mean? <laughs> Come on, what does it mean? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, I interpret that as going up into a mountain and contemplating the things that Jesus did. Where do you get that from? But people want to make it say what it doesn't say. And that's what's happening today. There's a lot of churches, Christian, that don't realize that Satan, the spirit of error, is in their church. You know? Let's make it more friendly. You know, let's take down the cross. Let's take down the altar. Let's take away this here. Let's just put a table like we have in our house, you know, with a cup of coffee, you know, and a seat. And let's sit down. Let's let the pastor dress with torn jeans, you know, his shirt tucked up and his sleeves rolled up so that people can feel comfortable with him. And they don't realize that you don't get a good, solid, expository preaching today. You get little, mini, little minute sermon, min, you know, little sermonettes. 
10, 15 minutes. Don't want to keep the people too long, you know. There's a little joke that starts out in the front of it, you know, and, and they give you a little little, little tidbit of positiveness, and, and, they, and they don't want to beat you down because you're already beaten down. What, what? That's not going to keep you, folks. If you need somebody to motivate you every day, something's wrong. If you need somebody to lift you up every day, something's wrong. The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Why? Because he knew who his God was. I don't need to read motivational books. I just got to know who my God is. And how you know you who your God is is when you interpret the Bible the correct way. Well, it's getting late already. Before I had mentioned that scripture in, um, was it Psalm 59 verse 10? The God of mercy shall prevent me. Remember we talked about that a little bit. God shall let me see my desire upon my enemies. Now look at the modern translations of that. I'm going to give you the, that's the King James Version. I'm going to give you the modern version of that, the New King James Version. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. The New Living Translation, in his unfailing love, my God will come and help me. And the Message Bible says, God in dependable love shows up on time. But if you look at it, it says, he shall prevent me. Oh, he's going to stop me. God's going to stop me. What's he going to stop me from? Oh, I see. He's going to stop me from desiring upon my, uh, you know, seeing my, des you know, desire upon my enemies. No, that's not what it means. We've seen that the word prevent is a different meaning. The word prevent in early English meant come before and is derived from the Latin words par pre, meaning before, and ventus, meaning come. Later in the ev uh, evolution of language, the principal meaning of the word prevent became to keep from happening or to hinder or forestall. There's quite a difference. And this is just one example of the, uh, of the obs obsolete words that can confuse the believer who is reading older versions. But I always say this, there's nothing wrong with King James. Some people want to get rid of the King James. I'm sorry. King James is the Bible. Okay? I use the other translations to help clarify, but I always go back to see what this says. Because if you look at NIV, I call it the nearly inspired version. Nearly inspired version. There's so many scriptures taken out of it. The blood of Jesus is taken out of it. So many. There's a book um, written many years ago by a woman scholar. Her name is Gail Ripplinger. She wrote, wrote a book called New Age Versions. That's in my library too. I think it's at home though. Okay, And she goes through all the different scriptures that have been taken out of the newer translations. And they say, well, it's not in the older manuscripts. Yeah, well, you know what? Maybe they got it wrong. Because it's in this one. Let's look at a statement. I got a few more minutes. Let's consider this statement found in John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now you might reasonably ask, okay, well, who is the Son? What does the word believe mean? Or if believe and obey are being used synonymously. But would it ever be acceptable, acceptable to interpret the statement to mean it doesn't matter what religion you believe because everyone goes to heaven. But how many people believe that? 
People that believe that everyone's going to go to heaven when they die nullifies the true meaning of this scripture. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. That's eternal life. Eternal life with God. It's not annihilation either. But the wrath of God abideth on him. So you have people, oh, you know, how many, every person that I've gone to and every funeral, they all made it to heaven. Somehow, some way, they were able to make it in. If they weren't able to make it in, they ask you to go light a candle, get them out of purgatory, say so many prayers and get them out of purgatory, get them on the way, kick, give them a little kick so they can get up into heaven. Come on. But people, listen to me, people really believe that. They really believe that everyone's going, it's universalism. Everyone's going to heaven. And Jesus didn't say that. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's pretty plain, right? You don't need no deep interpretation of that. Right? If I asked you that question, you would tell me, right? You understand that, right? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. If you don't understand that, you're spiritually blind by, blinded by the God of this world. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Pretty interesting. Let me just finish up this one section. When it comes to the central core of Christian faith, the biblical evidence is overwhelming. The deity of Christ, the triune nature of God, the creation of the Word of God, the sinfulness of all humanity, salvation by grace through faith, the resurrection of the dead, these and many other such matters are clearly taught So I'll stop here, because it's already 20 past 8, if you can believe it. Next week, we'll be getting into the section that says, what does the word hermeneutics mean? What does the word hermeneutics mean? Now, I know this for a fact. Okay. Now, Tom and Annie, you both had courses on this, right? Oh, he did, right? Okay. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll use you a little bit. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think you got a B. Didn't you get a B or something or an A? Yeah. Four, four. Yeah, it was like eight weeks, yeah. Well, are there any questions so far? But do you see how easy it is to misinterpret a scripture? Yes. Say this again. Right. Is the Greek. There was three, it was written in three languages. Some parts of the Bible were written in Arabic. But you don't have to worry about that because it's translated in the Septuagint. So they've already taken care of that. So every word that you look up in the Old Testament will be in the Hebrew. Because they already did the transliteration of that. So whatever you look in the Old Testament, it'll be Hebrew. Whatever you look in the New Testament, it'll be Greek. And that Strong's Concordance has every word. It has it categorized exactly where it is in every book, in all the books. So that word hand will be in Genesis. It'll be in Exodus. It'll be in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, so forth and so on. Proverbs, Psalms, the prophets, the minor prophets. It'll have it in the New Testament. And the New Testament will be Greek. But you can, you can always trace the history of that. When you look at a doctrine, look at it, what it says in the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
okay? Like, I'll give you an example. Real quick, we, we have to go. A real quick example is this. People will look at the scriptures. And I, I just lost my train of thought. I hate it when I happens. Oh, come on, Lord, help me. Holy Ghost. Mm. Mm. That's tough to get old. I just had it on the tip of my tongue, and it just slipped right out of my brain. I was going to give you an example. What was the example? Too much up here. Mm. Yeah. It's one of those senior moments, though, you know? It's like it was there, and it, I said another thing, and it went boop. It's like a little bubble that just busted in my head. No, because he's still talking to the disciples, believers. You could tell that to the world. They would say, well, what's that? What are you talking about? I don't know. I was going to use that. It was such a good example, too. It was an example of misinterpreting the Bible. <sighs> I hate it when that happens. Give me just a 30 seconds. It's 30 seconds. Oh, I got it. This is a true story. This woman went for counseling with this pastor. Now, when he told me the story, he didn't mention names, so I don't know who that person was, so it's okay that he shared that with me. Okay. She went for counseling, for marriage counseling, because it wasn't, it wasn't working out with her husband. He wasn't saved. She was a Christian. He wasn't. And she came to the pastor and she said, what should I do? And he says, well, you know, you can separate, but you shouldn't get a divorce. And she said, well, that's not what the counsel of the Holy Spirit told me. So he said, okay. He says, well, you tell me what the Holy Ghost told you. Did he tell you scripture? And she said, absolutely. She, so he said, well, where's the scripture? And she opened up the Bible and it says, he taketh away the first to establish the second. So therefore, I'm going to go marry brother so-and-so. Takes away the first to establish the second. Time out. That's not what it's talking about, husbands and wives and marriage. It's not, it's not talking about that. But see the misinterpretation of that? He takes away the first to establish the second. But that was justification. She really, 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 really believed that in her heart. Or how about this one? Take her, for she, for she is thy life. Hold her. Don't, don't let her go. It's in Proverbs. Some people married the wrong person by thinking that. Oh, see, the Bible says hold her, get her, get a hold of her. Don't let her go. It's talking about wisdom. It's not talking about a girlfriend. Oh, how about this one? The Lord wants me to get married. You know, I've been single for so long, and he wants me to get married. But he's not a Christian. But, the, but, but I, know, I know what you're going to say, but, the, you know, I'm going to win him to Jesus. But how doesn't that nullify, do not be unequally yoked with a non-believer? If what you're doing nullifies the Scripture, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. He says, your tradition has made the word of God of none effect. So we have traditions that we hold, or we think we hold, but actually makes the word of God of none effect. You go to India, you go to some of these foreign countries, and if a, a person is a Christian, 
and the husband's a Christian, the wife's a Christian, or even if the husband's not a Christian, and he dies, that woman will stay unmarried for the rest of their life. And when I was in India, this girl came up to me. She was crying. She wanted prayer. She says, my husband was a, was a Hindu. He hung himself, killed himself. And I have two children, and I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for a while, and no Christian will, will, will want to marry me. I'm, I'm, I'm unclean. I said, where do you get that from? So I called the pastor over. I says, you need to counsel her. The Bible says if your husband dies, you may go and marry whomever you will, only in the Lord. So the tradition is, no, 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 when your husband dies, that's it. That's it, over, you can't get married again. That's in your culture too. Portuguese, they wear black and they don't, some of them don't get married anymore. They just wear black all the rest of their life. But God says it's okay. You have permission to if you want to. So don't let tradition bring, a, bring us a situation in the Bible where you are actually nullifying the word of God through your traditions. Well, we just don't do it that way. Well, good, I'm glad because we're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it God's way. Amen? Any other questions before we close? Are we done with Facebook? God bless you. Love you guys. Anyone, anyone else? Questions, questions, questions. We're going to get into the real...